In this video, we are going to introduce some topics in voting theory. To begin, let's start with some definitions. If we're talking about the majority of the votes, then you would need to have more than 50% of the votes. So in order to calculate this, this is going to ask us to find that we are over 50% of the votes. So we'd probably want to know, based on the number of votes we have, calculate what would be 50% of that. And if any category receives more than those votes, then that would be the majority winner. Let's see that in this example. Suppose that we've done some polling and that alternative A gets 33 votes in all, alternative B gets 31 votes, alternative C gets 36 votes. Do any of these three alternatives, A, B, or C, get the majority of the votes? So in this case, since we know majority has to be more than 50% of the votes, we're not just asking who got the most votes, we want to know if anyone got the majority. Now, in order to calculate this, you first need to find the total number of votes. We would do this by considering that we've got voters representing three different categories, A, B, and C. We would add up all of these values together to get the total number, and we find that the total number of votes cast in this situation is 100, because 33 plus 31 plus 36 is 100 in all. Now, if we were asking ourselves if we need to get more than 50%, it might be first helpful to calculate what is exactly 50% of the total number of votes. And then to find the percentage of a number, you would just move the decimal place over two times to the left, and you would multiply that by the number in question. And we intuitively know that 50% of 100 is also 50 votes. So then we'll know if anybody has a majority, if anybody exceeds that value. And then we would want to see if any of the candidates has greater than that. So if a candidate's going to get 50% of this voting pool, they would need to have more than 50 votes. And as we look here, all the votes are in the 30s. So the answer to this question is no, none of the alternatives gets a majority of the votes. So we just saw the definition for majority of the votes and an example going through that. Another definition that we'd want to keep in mind as distinct from that is the idea of the plurality of the votes. So if you have the plurality of the votes, all that means is you get the greatest number of votes. It doesn't necessarily have to be the majority or greater than majority, but it might be. So plurality is just saying who got the most votes, not who represents a certain percentage of the overall voting class. Though those could be the same, sometimes they're distinct. So for, in this example, we have the same thing as before. Alternative A has 33 votes, B has 31, C has 36. And we're asked, do any of these get a plurality of the votes? Since it's asked about plurality of the votes, we just ask, does anybody have the most votes? Looking at this, we see that alternative C was the most popular because it got 36 votes as opposed to 31 or 33. So because of this, alternative C is the plurality winner. So as we go through these discussions, just keep these ideas distinct. A plurality winner receives the most votes of all the different vote categories. The majority winner is a stricter definition than that. Not only would it necessarily have the most votes, but on top of that, the amount of votes that it receives must be more than 50% of the total voters. So every majority winner is by definition a plurality winner, but not every plurality winner is a majority. So consider the majority as the stronger criteria. Now in these lectures and in the examples you'll see in the textbook, sometimes the votes are described by a table. And the way the table is used is it's just giving us a lot of information about the votes. So before we read through this example, let's just acquaint ourselves with this table. The first row tells you the number of voters. Okay. So you've got the number of voters, and then it's broken up into these categories. So imagine what's happening is whenever voters come into the voting, they see something where it's like, write in your first choice, write in your second choice, write in your third choice, and that's all one voter's ballot. So in this table, it has shown that there are 75 individuals 
who voted first for C, second for O, third for W. And whenever they tabulated all of these ballots, there were 75 that looked like this. Now let's think about what this section means. Okay. So in our ballots, once they were all collected, we saw there are 94 voters who still place C first, but then their second place choice differs. Now they want W first or second and O third. And there were 94 such voters for that. And then we could keep reading off the remaining columns. Okay. Now, Later, we're going to look at some ranked voting methods where it actually does come into play the ranking first, second, and third. But for majority and plurality voting methods, they only concern themselves with people's first choice. So at this point in the lecture, this table is giving us a little bit more information than we need. It's not going to distract us. It's useful for other voting criteria, but here just realize that for majority and plurality, you should only pay attention to the first row. So this example specifically is talking about a survey that asked to rank which of the West Coast states people would prefer to live in. The results are below. Using the plurality method, so that means consider just based on plurality who got the most votes, select the winner. So for either plurality or majority, we only care about first choice. And we're supposed to interpret California to be C, Oregon to be O, W to be Washington. Now, as we look through these first choice votes, we see that different categories voted for California first. The reason they're not lumped together in a single category is their second place and third place choices differed, but they still do agree that they would prefer to live in California first. So if we were going to tabulate the number of California votes, it would be 75 plus 94. Next, let's consider the number of people who would prefer first to live in Oregon. We see that's here and here. So the number of Oregon voters. And again, the way that we're reading this is 51 people chose that they wanted to live in Oregon first. And then if they had to rank second and third choices, then it would be Washington and then California. Whereas 12 wanted to still live in Oregon first, but then if they had to rank further, their second choice would be California and then Washington. The final two columns in the table represent voters who preferenced Washington first. And 68 voters in all preference Washington as their first state. So since we were asked to look at this election from the point of view of a major or sorry, a plurality winner, we are just going to see, does anybody get the strictly highest number of votes? And that is the case. California has 169 votes to 63 and 68. So it has the highest number of votes. So it is the plurality winner. In this next example, we have a different survey recorded. A small group of college students were asked to rank the best destination for spring break. S represents San Diego, L rep represents this lake, R represents Rocky Point. We were asked to consider who is the winner of this survey using the plurality method. So in our minds, we'd remember that plurality is just strict as who got the most votes and it only cares about first place choices. So even though that we're given more information, it doesn't necessarily come into play with this method. We've got three different possibilities. Let's find the total number of votes for each category. I recommend you take a moment to currently pause the video and then write it in your paper based on the table given here, how many people voted for S, L, and R, and then consider the, the plurality winner on your own. Unpause to check your work. Looking at all the first place votes, we see that there were eight people who voted for uh, San Diego, two people who voted for the lake, and then seven people who voted for Rocky Point. Now for plurality, they just care about who got the highest number of votes, and San Diego barely did by a margin of one, but it would be the plurality winner.
Now, we've answered this question fully, but we're going to be asked to consider what could go wrong if we just calculate votes based on the plurality method. And the idea is that people have certain different preferences. For instance, if we look at this uh, survey further, we see that yes, four people here wanted San Diego first, and then their choices were the lake, then Rocky Point. Four other people wanted San Diego first, and then their choices were Rocky Point and the lake. But if you look at the remaining groups of voters in these remaining three columns, do you see that most of them ranked San Diego significantly lower? Whereas Rocky Point had a very close uh, number of votes, it was only one less. But comparatively, if we were to show the people who preferenced Rocky Point or San Diego as a second place choice, we see that more people actually preferred Rocky Point as a second place choice to San Diego, because six preferred it as a second place to the five who preferred it as a second place for San Diego. So the idea here is that the plurality doesn't give account for ranked preferences, and the issue with that is... So some critiques of the plurality method of determining an election is that if you know it's just based on a plurality, whoever gets the most votes, some voters might not vote for their actual preference if they feel like their actual preference doesn't have a very good chance of winning. Because sometimes people might say, oh, I don't want to throw away my vote, because they realize what they actually prefer doesn't have a chance of winning. But instead of voting that actual preference, they choose to back something that is maybe less appealing to them, but they feel like has a greater chance of winning. Um, let's see an example of this in our previous example. So looking back at our previous example, what we're talking about here is just completely conjecture to try to illustrate some of the difficulties and why some people see problems with the plurality method of voting. So in this example that we've made up, we're making up another assertion. Pretend that we knew among these college students that there had been a rumor going around that a lot of them had said, I don't want to go to the lake. And now imagine that um, you actually did want to go to the lake, but you heard that rumor. You might think, oh, I actually really wanted to go to the lake. But if most of my peers aren't going going to vote for the lake, if I vote for the lake as my first choice, most people are going to outvote me. So it's really just going to be an election between who wants San Diego and Rocky Point if these rumors are true. So some voters might then think, well, if most people already I know aren't going to vote for the lake, then instead of just voting for the lake and quote unquote wasting my vote, I might as well voice a concern between whether I would prefer to go to Seattle, or sorry, San Diego, or Rocky Point, because I feel like it's just going to come down to those two possibilities. So then people who otherwise might have preference the lake first are going to choose between these two options because they know in a plurality, only the first choice matters. Okay. Now, there are different voting methods that try to accommodate for the idea that people's preferences are not always so strict, either you like this or you like that. There are other voting methods that are what we might call a ranked voting method that, allows, that still allow people to vote for their main preference, but still have a say in the voting if that main preference doesn't turn out to be the plurality winner. And we're going to see that upcoming. So in the next video, we are going to introduce the Borda method, which is a ranked voting method.